Jimmy, let's get right to it. Let's talk a little football. The leap of faith that you had to make coming to Houston after being on a really good team in San Francisco <laughs> and with all of the uncertainty revolving around the Texans before last season, could you have envisioned you guys doing what you did so quickly with rookie quarterback, rookie head coach? Everybody seems to be thinking that the future is really bright in Houston. If I tell you right now, I felt like we was going to go to the playoffs or if I would have said we were going to the Super Bowl or whatever, I'd be basically I'd be telling a lie. So to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. I just wanted to do my job to the best of my ability. If you look back at the beginning of the season, they think, I think they said we had a 99.9% .9 of missing the playoffs. And I want to say they expected us to win six games. At least that was double from the year before. Because the year before, it was like, I think the uh, Houston won three games. So, but we end up, we end up winning 10 games. And yes, I feel like the future is bright for Houston, Texas. And I'm interested in what's going to happen in free agency and in the draft this year. Well, speaking of free agency, I mean, how much of an impression did D'Amico make on you when you two were with San Francisco? And then how much did your relationship with him at the time play into why you ultimately ended up signing with Houston? Basically, I know me and Miko had to talk because of uh, uh, Coach Kyle wanted to move me, stick me into the places that he felt like he didn't have the right person in there. So, and I wanted to stay at safety and I... I remember when it happened, you know, I was I wasn't too happy about it. So I know I had to talk with uh Coach Kyle and then I had to talk with Miko and then I told Miko because I was like, Man, yeah, Miko, I think this this is it for me. I said, I think San Fran, I, I'm not gonna come back to San Fran. I think I need a new start. And he told me, Well, just if I get a head coaching job, I'll let you come and try out for safety. Free agency came, here comes Miko get the head coaching job. Miko calls me. It was a yes for me because of the type of man Miko is. First of all, he kept his word. Second of all, he's a man of God. And third of all, he's he's a family man and he's a coach's player. Not only the defensive side of the room, but the team in general with all the young players that you had and so many moving parts. How much did you have to become more of a leader on this team than even in San Francisco? Well, it was like in San Francisco, I feel like everybody took their parts in, in talking, you know, and talking in front of the team talking in front of their position, you know, leading by example. When I got to Houston, it was different. I just remember uh, the preseason. I kind of just sit back, watch how the pre-workouts was and stuff. And I just remember it was like no prep talk. And I was like, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of dead right now. I was just like, man, we need some juice. Damn, hey, bro. Hey, listen, hold on, bro. We got them pants. The guys was they was up to it. They you know they got they kind of got up and got them up. Let's get it. We ain't losing no more. We need to win. Shaq Mason, uh, the starting guard, was like, "Hey Jimmy, hey, man, that was that was good. I needed that. You know you got to do that for the rest of the year, right?" So, <laughs> so after that, I became the spokesperson for the team. So, yeah, I kind of uh, I guess I earned that job. Bring it up, bro. Win on two. Win on two. One two. Win. When do they make you captain? Oh, when did they? Oh, yeah. Uh, they made me captain right after. I want to say we did it at the camp. I want to say we only had like four captains, and it was like, what? And everybody was looking around, was like, "Hey, man, we we only doing four captains this year?" And I was like, "Shh, I was like I don't know, man. Miko, Miko, the coach. I'm like, I don't, I don't know." But we eventually end up adding like four more guys. That's what the team needed to. Speaking of what the team needed, obviously they got it. In C.J. Stroud, when did you think that this kid was not going to be your average rookie quarterback? I would say Danny Treats. Really? Jeff. It was, you know, during camp. It's hard to really tell during camp just because they, they slow it down for the quarterbacks. Slow it down for the quarterbacks. And the quarterback really can cheat the drill. You know, they can hold the ball longer. It could be two people run past them. They sack two, three times. They still hold the ball, pat it like five times and complete it. And I'm like, oh, man, come on, man. It's like, man, so you get sacked. But CJ challenged himself. That's what a lot of quarterbacks don't do. Quarterbacks be trying to make themselves look good and trying to make a throw, but it's like you're not challenging yourself because if you get in the game, if you ever get your opportunity and you patting the ball, you holding the ball, then once you get in the game, it's going to be sack, 
fumble, and what you're going to blame the O line. But eventually, you know, people start looking at you like, oh, he's not throwing the ball. He's holding the ball. It's people wide open. But CJ challenged himself. Each each week, uh, he started challenging himself and he started to get better. As you reflect back, have you ever been a part of something like this that moved that quickly, that fast forward? No, to answer your question, this is the fastest I ever seen something like this happen, like a turnaround as in a rookie head coach, rookie quarterback, and just a, a lot of new players, a new coaching staff, really, and a lot of new players, first year or second year players. And so, no, nah, i never seen it happen before. I'm surprised D'Amico didn't even win coach of the year. You know, the coach that he beat in the playoffs in the win, and it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, tough, tough business. Caught a lot of people by surprise, that's for sure. Why is this kind of stuff important to you? You know, not only writing a book and, you know, trying to get kids to eat better, but, you know, some of the other things you're doing in and around Houston to try to lend your name to trying to bring some positive change to wherever it is that you're at. I'm 32 right now and my parents still don't eat the proper way. So just my community, trying to educate my community on what to eat. But I really feel like it, it starts with what you put inside your body, what you consume it. Just over the years of just talking to different nutritional people, of just talking to a few of my strength trainer coaches, and it just basically educated me and, and just told me like what, how certain foods and just sunlight and water, how it affects you. I didn't really learn what type of, what was the appropriate nutrition to put inside my body until I was 21 training from the combine. And that's when I learned like the proper uh, ways to eat and what time should I eat and how much should I eat. Do you ever think when you were starting out playing college ball that you would have a career that would span over a decade? No, no, sir. I, I definitely didn't. I was just excited to just play a sport that my older siblings played. So once I got in the NFL, I was just trying to get to year three. The average years an NFL player plays is three years. Well, probably now two and a half years. Uh, so once I got to three and I was like, okay, that's that's my pension, my 401k. I said, okay, yes, see, can I get to five years? See if I can get to another contract. And once I got to five, I'm like, okay, let's see if I can get to eight years. So. You know, you never know when it's your time to uh, go, you, you know, because, you know, it's knock on wood, but, you know, everybody's one injury away where, you know, your career could be over. Jimmy, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. And appreciate you guys spending some time with the old man here today. Thank you, Chuck.